Let's imagine what your AI could be if you chose an open strategy. For starters, you could decide which models to use, what data you want inside. You could spread your impact and help your business adapt. You could seize opportunity alongside a community. Make your teams more productive and build products that are disruptive. Open is about innovating together, not in isolation, because that's how AI evolves to meet all our aspirations. Please welcome Senior Vice President and Director of Research, IBM, Dr. Dario Gill. All right. It is so great to be with all of you, and I remember being on stage two years ago, also closing the Think Conference. And I remember talking about the future of AI being foundation models. And I remember at the time, maybe that sounded a little bit abstract and uh, theoretical. This was uh, pre-GPT days. And boy, has that happened, huh? So as that you know, evolution of technology happened, we have seen a proliferation of foundation models of every possible size and capability. And it feels to some degree that the task is continuously keeping an eye on them, evaluating them, figuring out what use cases to leverage them for. But today, I'm going to challenge all of you to go on a slightly different mission. But before I give you that mission, I'm going to focus on what is truly going on and what is essential in this modern day AI revolution. And that has to do with the power of data representations and the power of being able to encode incredible amounts of information of every possible form inside this new, incredibly capable representation that are foundation models. And really, to understand how profound this is, I would like to briefly touch and go back to the origin of our digital world, an origin that was understood and conceptualized almost 350 years ago by Leibniz. Leibniz already then understood that you could take the information that was available around us in the form of language or mathematics or you name it, and be able to encode it in a binary representation. To create everything, one thing is sufficient, he said. He already knew the value and the power of representing information differently. In fact, the last number of decades have seen tremendous amount of value creation and of business transformation driven by the evolution of data representations. As an example, we could encode data in a relational database. When relational databases were invented and created, it allowed a different way to organize and connect data that we couldn't do before. And also, it had a very profound impact, not just on technology providers like IBM, Oracle, and many others, but on enterprises. All of a sudden, we could do payroll and transaction processing and so many other core processes differently. You could take the data and you can encode it differently through a graph. You could have nodes and edges and traverse that graph and that representation turns out to be very important if you're in the business of doing things like internet search or social media and doing graphs in terms of connecting people and groups. For the more geeky among you, you could take temporal data as a signal from an EKG as an example, and you could transform it through a Fourier transform to a frequency representation. And all of a sudden, you can do signal processing. Well. What is going on right now, it is actually the ability to have foundation models that can take training data and be able to represent it inside these models. So let's explore briefly how when we create a model, we take the training data and we break it down into smaller chunks that we call tokens. 
Now, a token can be a word or a fragment of a word, and this process creates trillions of these tokens. We convert each of those tokens into a vector, and a vector is just a collection of numbers. And we use vectors to represent the tokens in a form a neural network can understand. Here, we're talking as in words, but we could do the same thing for code or images or really any other kind of data. After the tokens are converted to vectors, they pass through the layers of the neural network, and we apply a series of mathematical operations that are mostly made up of matrix multiplications and a few other simple operations, but they are done at a massive scale. And as we progress through the network, it can combine and recombine information across the sequence of tokens. We can even combine information from different modalities in the same model. And during the training, what we do is we adjust the network parameters so that it gets better and better at representing the sequences of tokens. And as it goes through this process, it learns more and more of the structure of the data, its nuance, and the knowledge contained in the data. So it's not really magic. It's just math and human ingenuity and a lot of computing power. Now, the power of this new representation where we encode it inside foundation models derives its capability from its scale, just the sheer amount of data that we can bring in, from its connectivity, and from its multimodality. This connectivity is very important because we are taking these wide, disparate kinds of data, and by being inside the neural network and the structure, we are establishing semantic connections of that data once it is expressed inside it. And I will make an observation now and remark on a contrast that while we have witnessed over the last couple of years the fact that we can literally take all the public data that is available in the world and put it inside a foundation model. For the sake of argument, let me say 100% of that kind of data can make its way into a foundation model. Let me contrast it that inside an enterprise, what percentage of enterprise data is inside foundation models? I would say tiny, not even 1%. So this is an interesting contrast. All the public data has made its way in there. None of the enterprise data has made its way there. So I want to give you all a mission a different way to look at AI. And this mission is that the task ahead is to go together on a journey to represent enterprise data with foundation models to unlock its value. How many of you would you say that your data is one of your most valuable assets inside your business? I bet all of you. So the task is not about evaluating models. The task is to figure out how to progressively, safely, securely, and cost-effectively bring more and more of your enterprise data inside this new representation to create a massive amount of value. You'll recall that last year, I was talking about don't be an AI user. Be an AI value creator. This is the story of being an AI value creator with data. So the question is, how? How should you do it? So we're going to walk through three steps to go through this process of going from the 0% to a large percentage of your enterprise data represented. The first step is you have to start from a trusted base model. Because we're going to add the data to it. So we got to know what is in it and how it works. Once we have a base, we got to have a process to representing and encoding enterprise data in a systematic way. And we're going to show you how to do that. And after we do that, we have to deploy and scale and create value with your AI. Your AI. Why should you choose a trusted base model? Let me just give you an analogy for a minute. Imagine that. I give you a vessel. 
the vessel is going to be important because this is where we're going to add the data. But in this analogy, that vessel at the beginning looks opaque. And by the way, the vessel has some liquid inside, somebody else's data, some public data. And now we're going to add our data or liquid to it. It's going to get mixed. You don't know what is inside. You're going to shake it, and you're going to drink it. Probably not. That doesn't feel good. So in this world, the vessel needs to be glass. You need to be able to see inside. You need to know whether it has water or ice or whatever are the right things in there. So when you put your ingredients inside, you know what happens. So you need a base model that has transparency. And you know what its contents are, what data was used, the methodology that was used, so that when you add and mix it, you do it safely and securely. So these base model, these base models, need to have performance. That's undebatable. It needs to have transparency. It needs to give you broad commercial rights. In the end, remember, this story is not a story about providers of models. It is a story about your data. You need to have the rights so that when you encode your information in it, you have full freedom of action to do what you need to do for your business. And also, because you're consuming something that has data from the outside world and capability, it should be indemnified. You should feel safe that you can operate in that fashion. So this step one of starting from a, tra on a trusted base model is the reason we have built Granite. And it is the reason why we have open source the Granite family of models. And this is really important, and we're very proud of this work, and I want to show you what we have created and why it matters so much for the world of enterprises. Today, we have already released 18 models from the Granite series. You can expect more and more capability to come. But they come, they're models for coding, for helping you with software. They are models for time series. They are models for language. And they are geospatial models. And you see them here listed. So I want to give you a few examples quickly of what they are and their performance and why they matter. So let me begin with the code models, because we're very excited about them. I mean, code is becoming more and more the lingua franca of business. So the ability to deal with code, to write code, to debug code, to enhance the productivity of all the developers that are inside our enterprises is tremendously powerful and important. So I want to reference the performance data that I'm going to show you. On, on the code models, we have released a 3 billion parameter model, an 8 billion parameter model, a 20 billion parameter model, and a 34 billion parameter model. I'm going to pick the 8 billion because it is increasingly becoming almost like the workhorse of the industry. It has the right sort of scale and performance and cost. And as a consequence of this, everybody who provides kind of models has this size. So I'm going to show you a comparison for those in a second. We train this model with 116 programming languages. It has 4.5 trillion tokens in it. And you see here an example of some of the distribution of the programming languages with which we train the model. And it does all the things you expect, which, by the way, this is like almost like science fiction four years ago. I mean, it generates code. It translates code. It fixes code. It documents code. It explains code. And interestingly, it's really good at reasoning, too. So you can give it all these sort of like you know, reasoning puzzles and so on, and it helps like think through and sort them out. But I just want to highlight a moment that sometimes we have to like smell the flowers. What was happening a few years back on the dream of having computers to help us with code writing and so on was almost like a dream. And look at the progress that has been made. It is truly impressive, the capability of today's foundation models and generative AI. So it does all of those things, 116 programming languages. Let me show you the performance here compared against 
Google's Gemma model, Llama 3 model, um, Mistral as well. And, uh, and you see on blue, on the right-hand side, the Iberian Granite 8 billion model. Simply put, it's the highest performing model in the world for writing code for these 8 billion parameters. I'm really proud of the team who has done it because the characteristic of this is to build the highest performing family of models in the world, but to deliver it in a way that has all of those transparency characteristics and freedom for all of you to create value on top. So these models are also special in that they're released under an Apache 2 license that gives you the maximum level of freedom of action and rights to do that. On this category, only Mistral and IBM Granite of what you're seeing here are released under an Apache 2 license. By the way, if you want to learn a lot more about this, the team has published a paper that I referenced here, the Granite Code Models, a family of open foundation models for code intelligence, in which you will go into gory detail of all possible benchmarks, comparisons across all different modalities, how they were trained, and all the effort that went behind it. Now, we have also created a Granite time series model. And I'm going to show you the model making predictions of energy demand in Spain, in this case. So what you can see here is that the Granite zero shot prediction in the yellow line comes closer to the actual energy demand than the statistical benchmark. Then we fine tune the model to capture correlations with weather and make the prediction on the fine tuned model, and it does even better. Our granite time series models outperform several of the most popular state-of-the-art time series models out there. It has a lower average error with dramatical improvements in model size. And also, in another modality, and this one in collaboration with NASA, we created a geospatial foundation model called PRITHV. And we fine-tuned versions of that model and we're going to be adding that to the granite family of model. Now, this is one of the new fine-tuned granite weather and climate models doing downscaling of precipitation projections in Europe for the year 2095, from 150 kilometers to 12 and a half kilometer resolution. So that's 12 times higher resolution of climate projections. And our model can capture both regional and local extremes and impacts and it's the first foundation model for weather and climate to scale to global and regional areas. And these models, as I mentioned, they're available with this geospatial model that I just shared with you soon to come in Hugging Face under IBM Granite. And here they are. OK, so step one, the vessel. The vessel with the right properties, performance, transparency, freedom of action, indemnification. The next step now is how are we going to take our enterprise data and add it into the vessel, add it into the foundation model. And for that, we need to create a new representation of the data. OK, so what to, before we talk about our invention and our advancements, let's talk about how we do it today, how we all do it today. So let's say you take a large language model and foundation model, and you want it to interact with your data. What can you do? One pattern is RAG, retrieval augmented generation. So what happens when you do RAG? What happens is you take documents, as an example, that are your documents, and you vectorize them. So you put them inside a vector database. And what it happens is that that representation interacts with the foundation model in such a way that you ground the answers that the model generates in a way that is more tailored to your documents, to your need. That's what RAG does. Notice a couple of things. You're not improving the model. None of your data is going inside the model, right? The data is staying outside. And you know, are you really adding long-term value to your journey of encoding the data in a new representation? Not really, but it's a very useful pattern, right? So the model doesn't improve, uh, but it's useful application to specialize the answer that the model uh, can create based on your documents. Now, the second thing that you can do is you can fine tune a model. So you take a base model, 
And now you use some of the data that you may have to actually alter some of the model weights that are present in the neural network to specialize it. So what you end up is with a copy of the model. And you end up with a copy of the model that is specialized for a particular use case, but you pay a price in that you lose some of the generality that was present in the model. So if you have a different use case, you take another copy, you fine tune it, and you use it for that use case. So you can imagine that as you have more and more use case, you end up with more and more models that then you have to manage. And you have the disadvantage that you can sort of not merge those fine tuned models for a common share value representation. So that's what we have today. They're both important. We all use them all the time, right? And it's the only ways that we had so far of engaging these foundation models with enterprise data if you are not a model producer yourself, right? Because there you have a third tool, which is you can go from scratch and pre-train a model that does what you want. But the majority uh, of folks uh, don't engage in pre-training from scratch. So we've been thinking very hard about this problem, and our team here in research uh, invented a new methodology. And the new methodology allows us to actually make these foundation models truly an open collaborative endeavor, and it does so by enabling them to learn a bit more like humans do, meaning that we can incrementally add to the foundation model knowledge and skills to progressively and steadily improve the capability and the performance of the model. So you can actually engage in incremental skill teaching of those capabilities, and I want to unpack for you how that works and the business impact that it has. So this new capability is called Instruct Lab. And Instruct Lab is, at its core, it begins by having a taxonomy that represents the foundational skills that is there. So let me, for the avoidance of any confusion, what we mean by a taxonomy in this case. So a taxonomy in this case is represented by a tree where at the top of the taxonomy, you have this granite model. And for example, one of the things that we want our model to do is to be able to write, right? Great, so it needs to have compositional skills. So those compositional skills that involve writing, there are different types of writing that you can do. So one example of writing is freeform writing. And within freeform writing, there is prose. You can also write in verse, but in this case, you're doing in prose, and one example of writing in prose in free form is writing an email. And, you know, in this end of the branch that we're traversing here, I give you an example of what an email looks like. Okay, so you create this taxonomy, and uh, we've created them also available, but it's, you know, I assure you that after a few weeks of doing this, you end up taxonomies that describe a ton of what you have and what you do. Okay. So you begin with that, and that gives you a base capability of what the model can do. So now let's say that you decided to use an LLM to help you automate some of your business processes. That's your use case. And the base model that you chose was probably very well trained on general related, you know, general tasks that were related to your business, and that's why you chose it. However, it doesn't necessarily know about the specific use case for which you want to deploy this model. So to give it those capabilities, you must tune the model with specific domain knowledge and skills with Instruct Lab. So let's see how we add a new skill and knowledge to the granite-based model. So we start from this taxonomy that I described that includes all the skills and knowledge represented in the model. And here we create a new leaf node and attach a couple of examples of the missing skill that we want to teach the model. That is, we want to ask the model, well, we want to ask the model and we want the response to get back. And we give it three examples here. And we submit the request for this skill to be added to the model. Now this request is then reviewed by your team of experts for approval, and after you approve it, the examples are sent back to the instruct lag backend. Now we can also add new knowledge to the model in the form of documents or manuals or books or other high quality knowledge sources. And 
to get many more examples similar to the ones that we submitted, we use a teacher model to generate a large collection of new examples. We also generate a large data set of synthetic questions and answers that are grounded on your documents to teach your private granite model about your domain. And we use the new synthetic data to tune the model, first with the knowledge data, and then with the skills. And with your new knowledge and skills, the model just got better for your specific needs without losing the generality that makes large language models special. We do another quality evaluation on the resulting model, and if everything checks out, the model is now ready for you to use. And because we're not training the model completely from scratch, this can happen very quickly with a small number of GPUs, basically all just within one day. And here everything is transparent and fully under your control. So let me give you an example of our own experience of this journey with the methodology change. Remember, I told you that we created a family of code models. And one of the code models that we had generated was a 20 billion parameter model. And we had trained it on a wide variety of languages, but one of the languages uh, that it didn't know very well was COBOL. And we had made a decision inside IBM that we were going to create a code assistant called you know, IBM Watson X Code Assistant for Z to help with application modernization efforts for the Z platform, et cetera. And uh, so, so what we did is we started with that base model. It didn't know COBOL uh, very well. And what we did is we put a team who used the methodologies that was available then, fine tuning, and we used some extended pre-training as well, and we taught it COBOL. <laughs> and we did this through this process of, um, you know, iteratively, I think it was, you know, we did 14 generations of them, right, around it to improve the model. And, um, and then when the new methodology of InstructLab was invented over the Christmas holidays of um, this year, in February or so, we asked the team, hey, you know, we had that project where we have been fine tuning and improving the model to teach it COBOL. How about we try InstructLab on that project? So we did kind of like an A-B experiment kind of thing. And so the team took that challenge on, and they took the base model, and they gave it foundational knowledge. So they gave it eight COBOL public books, one mainframe COBOL programming manual, and one Java public book, okay? So they gave it that foundational knowledge, and they gave it some examples of skills. So for example, um, examples of how you go from COBOL to Java, right? They gave it a bunch of examples, good knowledge around that, and using the InstructLab methodology, you saw that you use a teacher model to then generate a massive amount of synthetic data of examples. In this case, the system automatically generated 200,000 examples and used that to improve the base model. So they did that experiment. And in one week, they were able to build a model that was significantly better than the model that we had worked so hard over all those months to fine tune and get to that level. That's really impressive. So the methodology, so improved by 20 points, for example, the code generation ability. But I just want to show you in contrast that today we all are creating value with RAG. We are all creating value with fine tuning. Just see how much value can be created through this principal engineer methodology that is enabled by InstructLab. By the way, once you do this, if you do it with this, RAG will get better. And fine tuning will get better. So it is actually a very powerful and important path to continue to evolve. So the story for us continues is that we created that, 
And then now we are able to bring it into the product. We're able to bring that innovation into the world. And here now you see an example into the code assistant for Z, where you're taking the COBOL script and you're saying, hey, explain to me what the code does. And voila. On the right-hand side, it gives you the explanation of what the COBOL code does. So quite amazing to see the possibilities that you can do. And this is also open source, the methodology. You can find it on github.com in StructLab. So two crucial innovations to bring you in your mission. And the final step is we got to help you get there. We got to productize all of this capability and support you and collaborate and create with you to make it happen. So what have we announced of how we're bringing them to market? And I want to simplify it as much as possible for you of what that core platform looks like. At the core of the platform is the announcement that was made at the Red Hat Summit, also here in Boston, a couple of weeks ago, which is RHEL AI, Red Hat Enterprise Linux AI. And we thought very hard together, collaborating with Red Hat, what is the simplest, most core capability that we could provide for this new age of AI to a developer? And in the end, we ended up with this conclusion of, it's a bootable model runtime, a bootable Linux kernel. Granite, the family of models with full indemnification, so the vessels, and InstructLab as a methodology that a single developer can start trying this business of adding skills and knowledge to the base model. One developer, one laptop. From there, and by the way, and if you're not even ready there, you can just live in, try the open source world. But this is a supported version of it with indemnification. The moment you go from one developer, one laptop, and you need to scale it up, and you need to have more GPUs, more CPUs, and, you know, an environment that allows you to optimize inference across different runtimes, et cetera, and deploy anywhere, wherever you want to deploy this capability, you have Red Hat OpenShift AI. And once you've done that, and you're happy with the model capabilities that you've created, and you're encoding more and more data into it, and now you go into the fact that you gotta say, okay, now I wanna take my version, your version of the Granite models, and I wanna deploy it inside applications, that's where Watson X shines. You're able to now create the patterns to bring them into assistants, to bring them into agents, which is a huge important direction for the field, and to provide governance and give you maximum flexibility. So let me close with a quick reflection and a challenge. The reflection I have is that one of the things that I'm most proud of, and I've had the fortune now of being in IBM for 21 years, right after grad school I joined, and this we're lucky to be living in this time. This is an incredibly exciting time in the world of computing. What is happening pushing the frontiers of semiconductors, AI, and quantum is accelerating. And what I'm most proud of, of the team that is bringing all of these innovations, is the way we are driving organic innovation in IBM is the best I have seen since I joined the company. Our ability to bring breakthroughs from research and to commercialize them in weeks or months, it is amazing. Every month feels like a year. However, it is impressive what is happening. <laughs> and to close almost where I began, that the future of AI is open, no matter what some say. Last year, to not only prove this point, but to bring a community of institutions together. IBM and Meta launched the AI Alliance. And now you see close to 100 institutions, some of the world's great universities, 
startups, medium-sized, large-scale companies, science agencies, philanthropies from all over the world coming together to say loudly and clearly, we too are going to contribute to the future of AI. We have talent, and we're going to invest our R&D and our capacity to create AI, to govern it, to make it safer, to make it more capable, to reflect the diversity that our societies have expressing our institutions. And that that future that we're going to build together, we're going to build it through open innovation. And that is a future that you should have total confidence that is the winning strategy for your business. And it is the right way to build AI in a way that supports the needs of our society. So I want to thank you for coming and spending these days with us. And to all the clients, to all the partners who are here with us, and also to all the IBMers that are making this possible. I really could not appreciate more. We could not appreciate more. We know how valuable your time is, and to spend this quality time with us is priceless. Thank you. Thank you.